we'll take the webinar now. Thanks, Neil. I appreciate it. I'm assuming you can hear me okay. So let's begin. Um, my name is Jim Gilmartin. I'm currently president of Coming of Age, the 50-plus marketing agency. We're located in Lyle, Illinois, in the USA. So thanks for joining me today and participating in this presentation on how to connect better with the 50 plus customer, which is typically referred to as the baby boomer or senior markets. Uh, I also want to thank the International Trade Council for hosting this webinar. So let's move on. Because of the restraints of time, we'll briefly cover uh, why the 50 plus consumers and customers are so important to you in your business what we know about them and what we've learned over 25 years of serving clients to connect with these markets. We'll talk about the shifting of paradigms on simply meaning that we'll be talking about how you look at these markets differently than you do younger markets. We'll also talk a little bit about how the brain processes information. Uh, we'll also talk about the value of storytelling and finally conditional positioning or which is also known as experiential segmentation. So 50 plus customers, um, let's briefly discuss why this customer should be understood better and why these markets are important to your business. You can see up here that the market itself is a tremendous in terms of size and the amount of dollars that they have available to them, seven trillion. Uh, you can see very clearly that the they're online and they're spending money on it, and they outspend most gen all generations uh, two to one. We'll go on to the next slide. We're talking about how they're growing. Uh, by 2025, we expect the population to grow about 16 to 16 million. That's three times that of the 18 to 49 population. Uh, we are living uh, three decades longer than we did just 100 years ago and expect that number to continue to rise. 27% uh, increase in the labor force participation of those 65 and years of years of age or older. And of course, they're spending a lot, while well, only roughly 35% of the population, they make about 60% of retail sales. Yet we see, uh, still see this conventional wisdom uh, get in the way of connecting with these folks. Less than 10% of marketing spend targets this audience. That's according to Nielsen. So how do we fix that? Uh, how can you as marketers tap in to these audience more effectively? So let's give you some insight into what we know. Um, we know that these folks are not one big monolithic group, and we'll walk you through some of the, the issues that you should be aware of. Communications have gotten tougher. That's what the chart is really telling you there. Uh, physical aging and behavioral changes impacts your organizations just about in everything you do. Uh, we've learned older people generally want high quality experiences with companies and people and often the quality of the experience counts more than the actual product or service you're providing. We've learned that as we age, happiness that is most lasting is found in personal experiences, not things. Happiness that comes with outings with grandchildren, a walk in the woods, giving back, helping other people and taking time out to savor a brilliant sunset. This is important to understand. Building relationships with all the customers is easier than they when they perceive your values are in line with their values, and we'll talk about that later on. We also know the information power advantage has shifted from companies to customers. Why? Well, the internet has magnified the number of conversations between customers about companies and products by an unimaginable number. A big result of the result of this power advantage is a much stronger sense of autonomy or independence and the feeling that they don't really need to depend, depend on any particular company for what they want. There are some rules that you really have to consider and sort of change 
if you are in agreement with some of the old uh, consciousness as opposed to the new consciousness. In terms of monologue, monologue versus dialogue, you need to conduct conversations, not unilateral communications. Uh, Product-centric versus customer-centric. You need to, to really try to attempt to heal the, ish, the, the folks that are out there and don't make selling number one. If they think of you as being someone that's going to help them, then your chances of connecting with them are much more uh, uh, likely. Economic values versus meta values. You have to help customers identify opportunities to experience greater meaning in their lives. That's important, and we'll talk about that as we go along. Rational versus uh, emotional. You have to invoke emotions because older people tend to depend more on emotions in making decisions than they did earlier in their life and when they were younger. Targeted segments versus communities of consumers speak to communities your prospects and customers identify with. You have to understand more about who they are, what's important to them in the fall and winter of their lives, and try to show that you identify with them. And then directive versus collaborative, you need to partner with the prospect or the customer to make the sale instead of trying to take control of the selling scene. And we'll show you some of the ways to do that as we move a little forward. What we've learned over a number of years of marketing over 25 to be exact, to these, these consumers, is that you need to sort of stay away from age as a driver for you. Yes, it's important to understand the age of people, but not as a driver. Consider marketing based basically on life stage values and motivators and universal desires that appeal to people across generational design, divides. Now, my intention is not to make you experts in how the mind processes information or understanding the values and motivators of these customer markets. However, the more you have a general idea of it, then you can move to a more detailed exploration. The sources for what we're going to be discussing today really are a variety of folks that are heavily into the world of behavioral science, understanding human behavior. Uh, psychologists like Abraham Maslow, who whose hierarchy of needs, the theory of human motivation, is known by most folks who ever uh, attended any, any of the uh, classes in behavioral science in college. Uh, psychotherapist Carl Jung, um, developmental psychologist Eric Erickson, who, who really focused on the theory of psychosocial development of human beings. Professor of neuroscience Antonio Damasio, who wrote, wrote several books, including Descartes' Era, a uh, major, major player in understanding how the mind works, Gene Cohen, who wrote a great book called The Mature Mind, and neuropsychiatrist Ian McGilchrist, who wrote The Master and His Emissary, It's the Divided Brain and Making of the Western World. A fascinating book, and his descriptions of the differences between the two hemispheres of the brain are memorable for their clarity and detail. For example, he describes why the left brain is, re is, restraint, is resistant, excuse me, to new information regardless of how brilliantly it's presented. Further, the left brain will generally not process new information uh, coming into the brain and it has been first processed by the right brain, and we'll talk a bit about that later as well. Knowing that early on um, in the connection process, we avoid ads with copious details about the features of a product. It simply doesn't get processed. Uh, get the brain's attention, the right brain's attention first, and provide them access to more information as they may require. And again, we'll discuss it a bit further. I'd like to just chat just a little bit about the female, female gender of the boomer marketplace. If you don't know it, women control about 85% of the purchasing decisions in the United States. Yet over about 91% of them feel the advertisers just, just do not understand them. But marketing to women doesn't mean think pink. It means you have to understand who they are and that a 55-year-old woman is not simply a 30-year older version of her 25-year-old self. There's no magic bullet in getting to these folks. It's a systematic rethinking of how you present your plan to women consisting of dozens of subtle shifts and fine alterations. Women women want you to speak to their heads and to their hearts. They clearly want you to understand them, to recognize their needs, values, and dreams. They don't want to do business with a person or a business that, that condescends to them. Although men's brains are wired differently, 
if you need the needs if you meet the needs of women you'll most likely meet the demands of men but not the other way around the point here is understanding how women process information and what's of value to them is in your best interest. They're the ones with the money. They spend it all. The husbands typically go along with it. Their boyfriends typically go along with it. So women's are, women are key in understanding this. And there are several books out there, uh, including Marketing to Boomer Women by Marty Barletta, uh, tremendous insights into how you can connect more effectively with these markets, these female markets, and not offend them uh, in the process. So let's talk about boomers uh, and whether they're the same or not. This slide is telling you basically they're not. There is no such thing as a pure boomer market. Uh, while there is no such thing as a pure boomer market, we can find common defining attributes when it comes to life stage. You can see by this slide here that we're very, all boomers and older folks are really very diverse, but the life stage has an impact on how customers uh, common values and purchase motivators are manifested. You, you need to understand them, and we'll talk about them in a moment. You need to connect with them, not so much what they think, but how they think and understand their behavior. So let's look on to some of these purchase values and motivators that are existing between the first and second half of life. So I'm going to walk you through this. Uh, by the way, I do understand that there's a lot of information you're going to be getting here. If you go to www.comingofage.com and you just click on the blog, you'll find a ton of information about how you can really exploit this market in a very honest and open way, being authentic, and you'll be much more successful. Uh, and as I said, while there's no such thing as a pure boomer or senior market, there are these common attributes or motivating underlying values, these MUVs, <clears throat> excuse me. As people move into the second half of life, there are really significant shifts. Uh, among the young, we know uh, in terms of the identity dimension you see up there, uh, the dominant worldview by skews towards dependence. You're depending on your family, your friends, the church, the community, et cetera, to help form your view of the world. However, as we get older, uh, we're much likely more biased towards autonomy. Uh, we have a degree of antagonism towards dependence. Uh, we, we want to be able to make our own decisions, have more control in our life. Uh, in terms of the relationship dimension, we move from materialistic to experiential. When we're younger, objects uh, are symbols of one's identity. You know, we, we move into our 18, 20s, and 30s. We make some money, we buy a lot of good things, and that's really telling the world, look at me, how successful I am. But as we move on, we move away from that, never entirely, but we move very, very heavily towards looking for experiences, meaningful life experiences that, that matter to us much, much more. In terms of purpose, the purpose dimension, when we're younger, we pretty much have an egotistic, egotistic bias until the self itself is developed. And then as we get older, it becomes the opposite. We desire to give back, whether it's knowledge, money, anything at all, to give back to the community. We have a tendency to do that. And if you look at those who are in the fundraising business, you'll find that it's the older markets that are giving the most money to them. Adaptation, we move away from novelty um, to uh, people tending to be increasingly drawn towards habit, the tried and true or try, yeah, tried and proven over the untried and unproven. And then finally, the energy dimension. When we're young, there's a desire to escape uh, the routine, to recharge the batteries, the dominant bias, along with strong interest in winning. And then when we get older, we find renewal in social and cultural engagement, as well as reflection and relaxation. So the point behind this is, if, if you're used to marketing to people that are in the 18 to 49 year old demo, and that's how you think, and if you're in the, in the business of doing this in terms of marketing sales and you are in that demo, your frame of reference is much different than those who are in the fall and winter of life. So our suggestion is to learn as much as you possibly can about those in the fall and winter of life, and you can learn that through a variety of different sources. One book we recommend is called Ageless Marketing, it's written by David B. Wolf. It's one of the best in the market out there. Unfortunately, it may be a little difficult to get because it was written maybe 10 or so years ago.
but it, it really brings tremendous insight into how you can connect and, uh, and develop tactics to be much more effective to, in getting to these markets. We're giving you an overview that's much more detailed. So we talk about, we talk about these defining attributes in the first half of life versus the second half of life. Clearly, again, I don't expect you to memorize the chart. The point here is to show you that in terms of identity when you're younger, we're depending on other people in terms of we, we're constantly we're developing. We get our esteem from social and vocational sources. We get validity from our accomplishments and so on. In terms of values, we're very egocentric and so on. And you can read this at your leisure. But when you look down at the defining attributes of the second half of life, you'll see that autonomy, preservation, uh, esteem from personal gains and validity of values is much more important to us in terms of our identity. We value relationships, independence, that which is meaningful, authentic, and honest. Our behaviors are practical right through that list. And then our motivators are absolutely experiences. We're much more altruistic. We're looking for control and we need to be engaged. So all of this is really important to understand. Uh, we're not talking about the first half of life being negative in any sense at all, but it is in fact what those folks when we're younger, that's what we think. In the second half of life, we're developed much more. We evolve from developing our identity to preserving it, from um, validating our identity through values, etc. as I've said. We begin, and you've heard me say this before, but I'll say it again, we begin shifting from a need for immediate gratification for material and material-based motivators to looking for meaningful life experiences. So the more you can develop a mantra that you are a gateway to meaningful, meaningful life experience for these folks, the better your chances of connecting with them. Your perceived access to meaningful life experience, both simple and complex, can result when your messages reflect this understanding of the defining attributes of the 50 plus consumers in the fall and winter of their lives. So we'll close up this section again uh, to try to, to make the point that as we get older, as we move into the fall and winter of life, we really do uh, look for that which is meaningful, that which provides us life experiences that help us understand uh, the, the folks that we deal with personally and business-wise, that they understand that and that they're interested in serving uh, the needs of folks in the fall and winter of life. Uh, if you communicate your knowledge of the 50 plus consumers, values, motivators, and needs in your messages, and your communications reflect your products supporting the life fulfilling customer experiential needs, you'll result in more effective campaigns and communications in this 50 plus market. So let's move on to behavior shift. Let's look at some of the rules that guide us in connecting effectively with the 50 plus customers. To begin with, uh, these rules uh, are really attempting to shift your paradigms. The, the old rules you may have thought about, the myths, the stereotypes about aging, are going to lead you down the wrong path. Uh, because we know as, as after 25 years of researching this and, and studying a lot of the research papers that have been put out on these markets, we find that much more people as they get older are much more realistic and more practical. Uh, depending on context, behavior is hard to predict. For example, if you were to bring a group of people into a qualitative setting, a research setting, ask them various questions, et cetera, they will give you certain answers uh, that they believe is the truth, but walk out of that, walk down to the, to the local Walmart or some other uh, retailer and do perhaps the opposite of what you thought. So you have to be very careful about using research to put all of your eggs into that basket. Uh, be careful that research is good, gives you good insight, good information to begin with, but don't be overwhelmed by it and have that direct uh, where you want to go. You have to understand that as we get older, how we behave depends on the situation we're in. We become much more attached and individuated. Uh, we talked about that earlier in the defining attributes. We're less subject to peer and other social influences, yet we're much more caring of relationships. We're also resistant to persuasion. Uh, we're less in influenced by hyperbole and advertisement. You know, we've lived long enough, we've seen a lot, and we understand that although you push your products and services getting it today or it's going to be going away, 
the chances are they're not going to believe that and they know as they're very 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 uh, much on the web are very involved in it purchase a lot do a lot of search and so on they know that they can get what they need when they need it uh, so let's move on behavior is more emotional and intuitive gut feelings mean an awful lot and it trumps reasoning you should be focusing on uh, peak experiences understand that we're much more introspective more self-informed and the key one here is understanding that we look for authenticity we look for that which is honest authenticity is essential as we age we become more highly developed and more honest about ourselves uh, as self-honesty grows so also does their expectations uh, that those they do business with will interact with them in an authentic fashion we reach the point in life where we want the unvarnished truth. So if you have problems with projecting that message, you could be missing out uh, significant opportunities. Okay, let's move on to the brain. Uh, we know that if you really want to understand how to connect better, understand how the brain works. It's only been the last 15 years or so that about 90% of the research on how the brain works has been published. We talked to you a little bit earlier uh, about Antonio Damasio and Ian McGilchrist and a variety of other behaviors that have been around for quite some time. These folks have put into the market now a lot of good information about how the brain processes information. You should get a, sen a sense of it and that's what we're going to try to do to you for you today. We'll move on to understanding this basic premise here. If you walk away from anything anything from this presentation walk away with this you need to get your message through the right brain in order for the left brain to agree and a decision has to be made um, the right brain uh, it really becomes much more active as we get older uh, we change our worldviews our values what people expect from life the right brain also likes metaphors images of one thing that reminds them of something else on the other hand, the left brain is unable to decipher metaphors. The left brain sees things in terms of categories, the right brain in terms of relationships. So the lesson in all of this is that as the older brain moves to the right, our communications must follow. Let's move ahead. You know, um, let's see where we got. Got it, there it is. Okay, the brain is somewhat like a typical emergency room. Um, th think about that. When you go into an emergency room, what's the first thing they do? They triage you. They move you that aren't really in need of a, a lot of immediate service to one place, the next medium, and next to high service, and that's how they work with it. So the point behind this particular slide is to tell you that if you connect, if you connect with the relevance to customers by monitoring their values and resonating with their language preferences. That's another thing. Try to stay away from jargon with these markets. They've heard it all. Just talk to them honestly and authentically, and you'll be in better shape. That message will have an excellent chance of reaching their conscious mind. Successful connecting depends more on what takes place in the customer's brains and minds than on the product or services you provide. Remember, it's estimated we see more than 42,000 commercials each year, and the brain processes billions of bits of information each day. It has to be able to triage information, and it does. And we'll show you how that works momentarily. This is trying to show you how the brain actually processes communications. Now, there's a lot of information I could be talking to you about, but I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible for you. Just think in terms of the only way that the brain is going to get information is through the, the various senses, right here, the visual, auditory, tactical, olfactory, and gustative. <coughs> Excuse me. And then it also gets information from other data. You know, that's what they've had, they've developed over the years, life experience, and so on. The one thing that you have to understand is that information actually moves to the brain first. It doesn't go to the conscious mind first, it goes to the brain first. And the brain only processes images, typically. Information enters the brain, as I said, through images, not necessarily word, words. 
It helps the right brain's comprehension of a matter that brings the matter home more vividly. Just remember, a picture is worth a thousand words. So if you're out there and you're developing a whole lot of, of copy, uh, trying to get all of what you're about into a couple of pages or trying to shove 10 pounds onto a five pound page, you're going to have a difficult time because the brain isn't going to get through to that. There's only two things that really make it happen. Good imagery, good pictures, good metaphors, and storytelling. And we'll talk about storytelling in a moment. But all this process works is that it goes to the brain. It then the brain looks at it. Is this something that I need? Uh, uh, in terms, does it integrate with what my life is about, my mind is about? If so, it moves into pre-conscious mind where relevancy is determined. It, it looks at those root basic uh, motivators we talked about, the defining attributes. And then if that passes muster, it moves on then to the conscious mind where something happens. They make a decision, they buy something, and so on. The brain really is an amazing, amazing uh, organ. Uh, and it has everything to do with communications. Uh, when you first connect with um, an individual, if you don't stir their emotions, you're only going to get a per portion of their uh, attention. The right brain lives on emotions. Rational information doesn't really work. It uses that once the right brain says, hey, this is something I'm interested in, we should move ahead. Uh, again, the right brain typically processes images. Information enters the brain as sensory images, not words. It helps the right brain's comprehension on a matter uh, that brings the matter more home vividly. It's also important to note this. Um, the brain and unconscious mind determines what's going on to send to the conscious mind with 2.2 to 2.8 seconds. It's immediate. It's going on all the time. As you're listening to me, if I'm not keeping your attention, you're off sailing on a cruise in the Bahamas. That's the reality of how it works. So if you don't have a sense of all of this when you're trying to develop your campaigns, the chances of you being successful in connecting with these markets becomes less and less. So let's move on to storytelling. Let's look at some of the findings that experts have told us that guide us in connecting effectively with customers. Storytelling is really key, especially in getting to people in the fall and winter of life. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, story, story, stories. That's what it's all about. As we said earlier, the right brain is where it goes initially, that information, and they love stories. Uh, and as I said also, uh, the left brain uh, turns a deaf ear, ear to declarative statements filled with facts and product claims. So let's talk a little bit about more about stories. Most of us really love stories. However, marketers need to understand, you need to understand, uh, really better the value of storytelling in communicating messages. As we age, stories even play a more important role in how our brains process information about your products and services. Uh, a researcher, Jonas Kaplan of the University of Southern California, published a study in January of this particular year, revealing that stories appear to be a fundamental way in which the brain organizes information in a practical and memorable way. Clearly, stories resonate with all ages and all genders. However, we know today that baby boomer customers, 50 plus customers, universes age weighted towards midlife and later values. That's that fall and winter I was talking about. We also know resistance to emotionally neutral information, all your product facts and figures, etc., cetera, um, which is mainly processed again in the left hemisphere of the brain, that increases in midlife. Therefore, receptivity to emotionally enriched information such as stories really increases in midlife. Stories create an emotional response generated by a message. The stronger the emotional message, the greater attention the communication is likely to get. So what's a story? Well, a story really, uh, it's been said, has a, has a beginning, middle, and end, and a voice all of its own. Uh, stories provide inroads into accessing our stored emotions. And where there is a human uh, emotion, there is always a story. And the point we'd like to make is that you don't need to write a very, very long story. For example, six words accredited to Hemingway are, quote, for sale, 
baby shoes never worn, end quote. Now, all of us, just on that alone, can figure out what that's all about very easily. It's complete. It has a beginning, middle, and end. His story pulls the reader into the communication by allowing them to use their imagination to determine his message and interest level and value for them. We'll talk a little bit more about this where it's tied to conditional positioning later on. Stories also insert pictures into people's mind and more directly into their right brains as we've been talking. The right, 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 right brain is where we process visual pictures, auditory pictures, aroma pictures, and so on. Stories are better than non-stories at arousing emotions. Thus, if a matter does not arouse feeling, it will neither get the attention or be remembered. Finally, a lot of these cognitive sciences, some of them we, I mentioned earlier, know that the only route to the left brain is, is the subjective right brain that the only way we can understand anything is to convert it into metaphors and stories. When you do the conversion in your campaigns, ads, and so on, for the baby baby, you save them some time from having to do this themselves. If you don't do the conversion, they may simply put your message aside saying, I don't have time for this just right now. So let's look at some examples of storytelling. This is um, a snapshot of a web page uh, called the B Group. The B Group owns about 10 senior living communities in Southern California. Uh, we help them change their image from the Southern California Presbyterian homes to the B Group. Major driver here is similar to, you may recall, the US Army had a theme, Be All You Can Be. That's basically the driver behind this absolute change of how they message, how they communicate with their markets. And here you can see how this notion of being short also tells a story. Just look at them. Meet someone. Create something. Get fit. Stay relaxed. Learn how. Wonder why. Have an adventure. Make a difference, etc. The whole basic driver behind changing the name and putting together an integrated online and offline campaign was to allow the people to themselves decide what that meant to them. Very successful in the marketplace. Here are some other uh, examples of the kinds of communications that we use to get that, that message out there. Here, to begin with, here's another tip. Try to use real people in your ads, as, as, if at all possible. Stock photos just don't work. They're not attractive people. They've been seen so many times in other companies using them and so on. So the more you can use real folks, the better off you are. These ads reflect, as we talked about, those defining attributes, autonomy. You're going to get uh, your independence here. We recognize that, and we're going to help you do that. Develop relationships, have meaningful experiences, get control in your life, and be engaged. These are the kinds of attributes that's important for these markets, those are in the fall and winter of life, to see that you understand and that those values are important to you as well. Now, I'm going to take you to a completely different industry. I'm going to move you into the funeral service industry. Now, if you recall, funeral service uh, ads are basically that, which in fact, you see little ads and they, they just talk about how great they are. What this shows you here is storytelling at its best. Here, uh, this particular group, Foundation Partners, owns about 40 funeral homes around the country and 20 cemeteries. We were engaged to help them figure out how they can get some, a message out there that's different from their competitors, and this is what you're looking at. Each one of these ads tells a little story. Uh, uh, the vet here talks about how he served time, his, his put time in to serve his country, etc. He was very proud of himself, and we're proud of him. And in fact, uh, we, we, when we had his funeral, we made sure that all of that that was valuable to him was there for all of his friends to see as well. So these kinds of ads are really key in, again, getting it across to your markets. The next one goes back again to senior living, but it also really works well for you. Because what this is trying, what this is saying, is it's focused on potential residents. And it talks about, I love 
that we always had something to do. And she tells a story about when she was younger and how now that she's working or living in this senior living community, she finds the same values that she, re that she remembered and loved when she was younger. You can see the dark photos on the top showing the kids on these monkey bars, etc. The other ad tells me basically the same thing as the story of how when she was, they, they were younger, uh, they work, their grandmother showed them how to cook and do different things. That all leads to, again, people processing this information emotionally. Receptivity to emotions are enriched, and stories do that. These are the kinds of ads you can, again, just take a look at when you have a chance, when you get a copy of this presentation, and, and you'll see exactly what we're talking about. Okay, we talked about the brain, we talked about stories. I'm going to move you into what we call conditional positioning. Uh, some call it uh, experiential segmentation. Now, what conditional positioning does, it's tied to this. As we get older, uh, we reject absolutism as a means that marketing communications uh, uh, are generally put out for them. <clears throat> And what we're finding is that since they reject absolutism, meaning, hey, we're the best thing since sliced bread, we found that if you use conditional positioning, allowing the consumers to, in, to look at the ads and, in fact, interpret it as individuals, it helps you move away from, from um, net fishing to fly fishing. Um, absolute positioning uh, aims to generate a uniform perception of a brand. Uh, we'll show you that in a minute, what that could look like. Conditional positioning allows for a diverse perception of a brand. So I'd like you to do something for me while you're looking at the screen. Just sit back a little, close your eyes, and listen to this story. Well, not the story, but listen to a description of an ad. The ad was made by American General Finance many years ago, and it appeared what appeared to you in the ad was a man standing on a beach, uh, looked like he could have been in his 60s. He was facing the beach and actually looking at either a sunrise or sunset. His pant legs were rolled up to his knees. And the only line on the ad was, live the life you've imagined. Now, that's taken from Henry Devon Thoreau. And in fact, what that does, it allows you to decide what that means to you. Living the life I've imagined or I imagine is not the same as the life you may imagine. So the reader, the ad really allows the reader to interpret the message based upon his or her individual needs and desires. Uh, this, is, this is an example of conditional positioning versus absolute positioning and the concept of less is more. Again, not putting 10 pounds of copy into a five pound page. Older people, uh, more than younger people, buy experience opportunities more than they buy products or services. But if they see the products or services are going to lead them to a meaningful life experience, they're, they're hooked. And that's the best way for you to get that message out to them. The aim of conditional positioning is to generate multiple perceptions of the message and customers' minds are defining the message in terms of experiential value to them. So this really is, is, is trying to get the message across, and we're going to give you an example of how this works in a moment. But we're trying to get across to you that in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases, experience of segmentation or conditional positioning can be much more effective than you just pushing your product out there. This is an example of what we'll call uh, um, not conditional positioning, but absolute positioning. Uh, BMW, the ultimate driving machine. Absolute position is about the product. There's no doubt about it. Remember, you may remember BMW's uh, driving machine uh, Ad, uh, it's very well suited to the younger age group that once dominated the marketplace. That's all changing now. We talked about that at the very beginning of this presentation. Absolute positioning drives for an objective image of the product on a mass market basis, an image everyone recognizes the same. So the point behind this is that you have to think about what you're trying to convince your markets to do. Once you have that, if it's basically bang, 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 get them to pick up the phone, get them to respond to a direct mail piece, get them to respond to your website, etc. right now, etc. 
because there's a product or service you're selling, you may not consider uh, using the concept of conditional or positioning or experiential segmentation. On the other hand, if you're trying to brand your organization as one that can help people uh, develop and have meaningful life experiences, this is the approach to go with. And this next slide just shows you an example of a conditional positioning ad uh, that's also tied to storytelling. Uh, live life your way is the way to go. It lets people determine what that means to them. It's tied to a story that talks about how, uh, just give me a second, uh, what this does is talk in, a le in the letter, what it does is draw them into the story by telling them about how one of their uh, customers was really interested in taking their daughter to the Grand Canyon and so on. And because of what the company did to reduce their costs, that took place. This kind of thing uh, could appeal to any observer, any reader. Uh, the concept of live your life your way allows an interpretation of the message based on the uh, uh, based on the individual needs and desires of people who are looking at it. They not be, may not be planning a trip to the Grand Canyon, uh, but they may have something else that's special in mind. Uh, they may desire to feel like the individual, her name was Emily, looks, she's happy, relaxed, at ease. We are trying and attempting to pull the customer into the communication rather than pushing out products or service about how great the product or service is for this particular company. Pull it in, allowing them to use their imagination to determine what the savings could mean for them personally. So let's go to summary. Everybody loves a summary. Let's go to summary. Here's what we're really trying to get across to you. Um, the problem isn't what marketers don't know. We all know a whole lot. The problem really is what marketers know that really isn't so. And that is that over the years, from Madison Avenue, New York, right through all, all industries and corporations and companies, big and small, we have perceptions about what it's like to get older, and those are tied to myths and stereotypes. Uh, well, we're, we're suggesting to you that sort of put that aside, because the longer you believe that, the chances are you're not going to be as successful as we could. So we laid out what we thought we knew and now what we know now from bending the customer's wills to the market, marketer's wills to adapting to the customer's wills. Marketing being about numbers to marketing about being behavior or behavioral responses. That's what we've been talking about. Power wins over market. You just keep shoving it out there often and, and consistently, and they'll do it. Today, customers now have the power advantage. They know with the, with the internet, they can go in there. And again, uh, if you remember early on, uh, there are a significant number of folks that are in that 50 plus category that are online and buying. Controlling customers is a key to success. Now, letting customers lead is key to success. And then from strategic uh, control of information being considered vital, the information flow is no longer controllable. We get it every place we go. Um, and by the way, that, that first headline there is really an adaption of a Mark Twain quote. Let's go on. This sort of wraps it up. Um, some sage advice by an anonymous. The website is blessed. The web insight is to be a thousand times blessed. Uh, the screen itself shows you all kinds of numbers as to why you should be dealing with the 50 plus market. Just remember this, numbers don't buy anything. Numbers don't buy anything. People buy it. And understanding what's going on in the minds of folks that are 50 plus in the fall and winter of life is really in your best interest. So we still have a few minutes left. So I'm going to just go right into uh, the appendix. I wasn't sure whether we'd have time or not, but I think we do. We're going to focus a little bit on, on uh, the Internet and what's happening there. Reaching the 50 plus audience online is amazing. You can do it so many different ways. You're trying to get from the orange globe here to the blue. You want to convert these folks, get those conversions, but you do it through remarketing, organic search, paid social, video, direct pay. It just goes on and on. Digital media has moved from a 
from a strictly direct response medium to a multifaceted channel uh, with potential to reach customers across every point in their journey and both, both genders. If we go on a little further, we'll talk about some base, just some about seven marketing channels that we think are important to you. We won't spend a lot of time on it. You can look at this and read it as you get, get a chance. But let's just walk you through the, these eight, okay? Here's what they're doing online. Look at this, 65 plus, 88% are on email. 82% use search engines. They're out there and they're using them. You cannot ignore this. The next slide, email is a powerful channel for mature consumers. Uh, it's, it's really, this is a little uh, story uh, from a marketer, an email marketer, uh, talking about uh, the uh, generated, they generated an average uh, rate of 19.41% and a 4.75% click-through rate uh, and an 18% inquiry to subscriber rate. These people are out there. If you focus on them and take some time to better understand them, you'll have a better shot at being successful. They make purchases. Not only are they on there, but they're making those purchases. Don't ignore them. Tomorrow's highest purchase power or consumers are the ones who skew much higher in digital shopping. And if you take a look at this when you get a chance, you could see a large share of middle-aged consumers are shopping online. It's a tremendous amount of dollars that are being lost if you're not paying attention to this and understand how to connect with these folks both digitally and traditionally. We'll go on to the next. Word of mouth is really big. This is a big issue, and especially when you're dealing with women, boomer women, these folks talk. And when they talk, they spread the word. And when they don't understand, they go to their friends. So you're, you're trying to get across there that you understand who they are. Your brand should reflect their values and motivators. They should feel very comfortable to pick up the phone, drop your line, fill out a card, go online. They should feel comfortable because they understand who you are. And there are some great sites out there that can do that. If you move ahead, Word of mouth and, and peer recommendations are the most effective motivator. And that's what this story is really telling. Word of mouth is important. Peer recommendation is important. If you go online, many, many people, especially in the fall and winter of life, they go right down to the testimonials if they go onto Amazon.com. And they're looking for what other people are saying before they purchase. It can be something that helps you or it can hurt you. They've got to see you in, in, as an organization who appreciates them, who they are, understands their values and motivators, and that you're in sync with them. Without that, a little more difficult. 71% of boomers and 59% of senior seniors use social networking. And what's the big kahuna? What's the 800-pound gorilla? Of course, Facebook. Others are coming along, but Facebook is the one you want to look at if you want to get into social media. Over half of boomers and seniors watch online videos. So if you're into videos or not into videos, you should be. If you're into videos, make sure that they're realistic. Using just actors and so on is not really going to get the message across. They want to see themselves. And if you're going to use actors, show actors that look like them, not that look like 40 years younger than they really are. It doesn't work that way. And people are too smart, and they appreciate authenticity and honesty, as I said earlier. And the last slide in this segment is basically mobile usage is growing very rapidly. If you're not paying attention to that, your chances again of success are really less and you should be you should be paying as much attention as possible to all of these, online, traditional, and mobile. But don't miss the message I'm trying to get across to you and that is they are there. These are the folks that are in fact going to be doing well for you down the road because every day somebody turns uh, 50 years of age, 10,000 people turn 50 years of age, it's over 4 million a year, and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So with that comment, uh, I'll go down to the end here, if you give me just a second. That's it. That's really it. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I do appreciate it. I hope you've learned something about it. Again, if, you, if you're interested more, simply go to uh, comingofage.com, go right to the blog, and also there's another section, another link there for what we've learned. You'll get a lot of good information that will help you do a better job 
in connecting with these markets. And that's it. Thanks again. Hello everyone, this is Neil from International Trade Council. Thank you for attending the webinar today. The webinar copy will be sent within seven working days. Thank you.